Good morning, church. Good to see you today. A wonderful day and a wonderful weather, right? <laughs> this is my kind of weather. Though I am overdressed for today. <laughs> but thank you for joining us for today as we study God's Word. For those who are visiting us for the first time, we are going through the book of Acts, and we are in chapter 4. We'll begin there at verses 32 through verses 11 of chapter 5. And what we are going to talk about today is the great deception. Before we read God's word, let us bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word that is alive and sharper than double-edged sword. As we are having it before us, reading it through, we pray that your Holy Spirit will cause us to understand that which you have set before us today. And we ask that you give us understanding, give us proper interpretation, and help us to walk with it even as we receive it in our hearts today. The meditation of our hearts, the words we speak, may they find grace and favor before you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we were in the portion where this man, the apostle, were taken before the elders, and we saw their boldness not relenting. They asked the governors and these rulers that whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And that is the basis of their preaching. They, uh, they have such confidence in Christ because they walked with him, they saw him, and they have experienced these things firsthand. They will not shut up. They will continue preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when they went back to their, the, the rest of the people and told of all that the rulers were doing to them, you know what they did? They prayed. They didn't say, well, because this is the situation. Let us pray these people out of the office. Let us pray that something bad will happen to them so that they will not speak again. You know, that was not their heart. When they went back home, The believers prayed that God would grant them boldness so that they may speak God's word again. And the Bible told us that when they were done praying, the place where they were, the Holy Spirit came upon them, it shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they went ahead and spoke the word of God. So anytime you pray about anything and God fulfills it, make sure you do exactly the same. And here we have um, a story that is, you know, good and bad for other people. That is why I title it The Great Deception. This is the first place we are going to see Satan is mentioned because of reasons that we'll read ahead. So if you have your Bible, please Turn with me to chapter 4 of Acts, verses 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they all had things in common. And with great power, the apostle gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor nor was there anyone among them 
who lacked for all who were possessors of land or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, or Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, his name was changed, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, had possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds his wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it before the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and kept back part of the prize of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. Then great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men came, arose, and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, to tell me whether you saw the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to taste the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. That is the blessed word of God. <laughs> I know maybe all of us, we have interacted with these two names, Ananias and Sapphira, right? What do we know about them? that they were liars. <laughs> they lied about something and they were struck dead and this cannot be taken away from the memory of people. What the Holy Spirit did just at the beginning of the church. You know, looking back at the previous chapters and verses, Satan had failed completely in his attempt to silence the witness of the church. However, the enemy never gives up. He simply changes his strategy. His first approach had been to attack the church from the outside using these religious leaders, hoping that arrest and threats would frighten the leaders. When that failed, Satan decided to attack the church from the inside and use people who were part of the fellowship. He tried to use people who were outside. It did work. Now he's coming in to use the people who are inside the church. So basically, this message is not for the people out there. This message is for the people who are inside the church. It is interesting that when Satan is first mentioned in the early church, he gets through with the money issue. That is where he gets through. 
It's money. Think about it. <laughs> they tried to come and, you know, silence them, telling them, do not preach anymore through this name, the name of Jesus Christ. Do not test, don't speak about, you know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Go your way, but don't do that. That was the command from these, these elders. But we see Satan getting through, and he got people. He got people who were part of the fellowship. So as I was reading this and was speaking this, the Holy Spirit is speaking to Calvary Chapel Eldoret, speaking to us today. We see here in the Bible, it tells us that now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. They were in such a sink. They were working together. They had possessions. They had land. They had houses. And they chose to sell them so that other believers would benefit from it. Remember this time when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, people had come to celebrate the Passover, the, 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 the Pentecost. And many of them supposedly were still in Jerusalem. They couldn't have a way to make money or to have a living. And they, you know, in a short period of time, they came, they became part of the church. And the believers decided with their own will, they were not pressurized with anyone to sell their own properties so that they can have things in common. And so as we go through, we'll see, you know, the names of three people are playing a bigger part. And number one is Joseph whose name was changed to Barnabas, meaning the son of encouragement. And we shall see, actually, his name is mentioned over 25 times in the book of Acts. He became a very important figure in this early church. And then the next person is Ananias. You know what Ananias means? God is gracious. God is gracious. That is the meaning of Ananias. So you might as well go ahead and give it to your children, right? <laughs> Sapphira, you know what it means? Beautiful. I mean, we've never dedicated one child here called Sapphira is an Ananias. <laughs> Because of the nature of Barnabas, Barnabas had to serve the Lord. What he did continued to impact the church even until today. While the couple died at the breath of a lie. Think about it. We have a man who chose to serve the Lord with what he had and it went a long way. In fact, he, he was the number one guy who encouraged Paul when he was beginning ministry. We see great generosity with them, those who had properties, those who had, you know, land and houses, and those are big things, right? The, many of us, if not all, those are the things that we want to get first, right? Get land. Build your house so that your house of, you, you, you're out of rent. If there's something that brings pressure <laughs> to people, is house rent. You just pay today. Before you know it, it is next month. <laughs> They're waiting for the house rent and all these bills and all these things. Some of us were wishing all, you know, all our lands in the villages would come to town. 
And they sold all these things. These believers were walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. They read God's word and depended on prayer. That is what kept this church alive. That the Holy Spirit was with them at all times. They dedicated themselves in the reading and the public reading of God's word. And they depended on prayer. And we saw last week that even when they prayed, they prayed scripturally according to what is written. It is very powerful. And also the Bible mentions here that they walked in unity. The psalmist in Psalm 133 said, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil running upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron. Did the Bible mention beard? <laughs> Those who go to Kinyosis to cut your beards every time, be mindful. I mean, when the anointing oil is over your head, where will it? You just splash and go where? <laughs> it is meant to grow in, on men's faces, by the way. That has nothing to do with the message. Running down on the edge of his garment. It is like the dew of Hammon descending upon the mountain of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. And this blessing is life forevermore. Think about it. Where there is unity, God does not suggest a blessing. He commands a blessing. Life forevermore. That even when this mortal body will cease to be, they will have life after this. Unity of purpose, working together, not just getting along, but working together, knowing that the Holy Spirit is guiding us, the Holy Spirit is leading us. Unity is a condition that attracts God's blessing. Therefore, at all costs, strive to achieve it. Strive to achieve unity at whatever cost. Sometimes you'll have to lay your pride aside so that you can go and mend things, make things straight, either with your partner, with your friends, with your colleagues at work, whatever it is, lay your pride down. Unity was very important for the growth of the early church. When the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is at work, God's people will be united in their doctrinal beliefs as well as in fellowship, in giving, and worship. All these things, they are not separated from each other. That is why we, as we give here at Calvary Chapel, it is part of our worship to the Lord. And we see that this is where the enemy got a foothold in the lives of Ananias and Sapphira. That they were tempted through money to keep some for themselves. And also we see that there was God's favor upon the people. Religious leaders tried to stop God's work, but they, were, they got afraid because of the people. They said, well, these people, they, technically they, we, we can't keep them here. There's no fault. If we keep them here, what about the people? They might come and stone us. They might come and kill us. So let us just release them. Let them go, but severely threaten them. They thought the threats would work, but it did not work with them. Any spirit-filled church or person will have great 
opposition. That one will come for sure. If it hasn't, get ready. And if you're busy for the kingdom, you know that these things, they come. But be ye encouraged because Jesus said, I'll be with you until the end of time. So whether they come or they don't, we know that our Lord Jesus promised to be with us. Because they testified of the resurrection, God added to the church. The church grew not only as a result of the apostles, but everyone who got converted had the boldness from the Holy Spirit to be a witness of Christ. From the 3,000 who got born again the, the other day and the 5,000 who got born again, all these people, they got the boldness and they would speak freely to people about Jesus Christ, testifying about this resurrection. And the Bible says it was added to the church daily. Because the Bible tells us also that, you know, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and, the, and great grace was upon all of them, upon everyone who was converted, upon all the believers. Every one of them. You remember first Peter told them that that which you see in us, that which we are sharing with you today, it is not just for us, it is for you also. Therefore, repent and be baptized. Turn to the Lord. Now the, the Bible here talks about the, you know, the generosity of the people. People had properties. Land is always a big deal. Houses, always big deals for everyone. And they had these things, they decided to sell them so that everyone would have something. And because of the, their situation back then, they saw it failed to sell their land and other properties to help fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. Note that all these givings were done through the church and its leaders for proper distribution for at the end they all lacked nothing they brought them before the apostles so that it will be distributed evenly to people that is why if you belong to a local church or a member of Calvary Chapel or whatever place commit yourself to serving God with your finances. Of course, not bringing them at the feet of <laughs> the pastors right here. I've seen it happen many times. I once was invited for a fellowship, a church in town somewhere. I will leave unnamed, or I may name it at the end. And then when he was, the, 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 the reverend was done preaching, it is time to give. He said, all the tithers to come in front and bring their tithes. All the tithers. So a few people with their money in the envelope came forward, laid them before the pulpit where the man was standing. I looked at that and my heart was grieved. For the rest of the people who are not able to give their tithes. And you know this is also a form of manipulation. So that next time, you also take the envelope, put something so that you won't be seen always sitting when people are called forth to come and give their finances. So you're being manipulated and you don't see it 
All he's thinking is the man of God said, and we are taking it to the feet of the man of God. Be warned, church. Be warned. The first time, you know, Satan is mentioned, it is tied to money. Be careful. Serve God. If we want to go through, you know, the subject of money, we'll go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. It talks about money extensively, how we ought to give our money. And Josh taught this in details. You can find those sermons online if you so desire to. But they lacked nothing. When the Holy Spirit is at work in an individual or the church, giving becomes a blessing, not a burden. If if you're still giving and, you know, you're striving within yourself, please don't give it. Because sometimes we think, God needs my money, God needs this. He doesn't. (laughs) In fact, when you're giving... The benefit is you. Who benefits from the giving? It is you. It's not God. He owns everything. You included. Why would you think that he needs your money? (laughs) This money is a very sensitive subject, right? (laughs) Very sensitive. You know, many of us, I know we've come from places where we were so manipulated every Sunday, every week, every time. It's money, 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 money. I mean, we only talk about money when it shows up in the scripture, right? That is what we ought to do. But then when we don't speak about it, people say, voila, they don't mention money, so I won't give. Have a proper balance within you to serve God with what he's given to you. We, we don't have to point guns at your faces like, what do you got today? You're going to serve the Lord or you're going to? All the titers this side. <laughs> the, the, the people with coins. <laughs> Those who don't have, we pray for you. That is not why the church exists. That is not. We, we give because the Lord has blessed us. And for sure, he has blessed us abundantly. When I was a young believer, I used to begin on how much I'm going to give because I want to keep a bigger percentage for myself. For me, myself, and I. The great trinity. <laughs> But when you grow in the Lord, you're like, God, help me to be faithful in what I'm giving to you. God loves a cheerful giver. He blesses them too. So this lesson here is not for us also to go sell everything we have, our vehicles, our houses, and our land, to bring them before the elders of Calvary Chapel Eldoret. But principles to learn how to be faithful with what God has given to us. Well, if you want to g- learn more about giving, as I mentioned, go to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. This man again, Barnabas, a few things we learn from him. Number one, he was a generous giver. When he's mentioned here that he sold his land and brought it to the apostles' feet, this was probably not the first time this man was seen in action or serving the Lord. This man, they also you know, because they changed his name, called him the son of encouragement. He was probably busy encouraging people, you know, walking around, talking to people all day, all day, all day, walking, 
encouraging people, praying with people. And this was seen by the apostle. They noticed it. And it's a great principle for, for us to learn, especially the church leaders, before we lay hands on people, we got to see how they have walked with the Lord, how they are faithfully serving the Lord in a local church before we appoint them to be either deacons or pastors. Because sometimes we can be very hasty. You see someone day one like, voila, like Samuel. So Eliab and he thought, this is the anointed one of God because we are deceived with what we see. He was a generous giver. He was a man of noble characters. And his noble characters, you know who was watching? Ananias and Sapphira. They saw his noble act and they were filled with envy so that they attempted to impress the church with their giving and they ended up being killed. <laughs> they wanted to put an impression to the church, to the elders, that, ah, this man sold land and he, I think he's in the good books of these leaders. Maybe he'll be given a position and remember, we are talking about the events right into the church. They say, well, let us go and sell. But their, their hearts were not right with what they were doing. It wasn't right. Also, we see that Barnabas had an important ministry in the church called the Ministry of Encouragement. This is mentioned over 25 times in the book of Acts. This man, Ananias. And how he owned the land is still a mystery to many of us. Because the Bible mentions here that this man was a Levite. And we know all the Levites were not supposed to own land. When God was giving distribution that this tribe will be here and you'll be here and you, this is, is your possession, you go and fight and you possess this land. And God said to the Levites that I am your inheritance. You guys are not supposed to have land. How this man was owning land is still a mystery. But probably they say they think, or where he was living in Cyprus, this law did not apply to this country. So he perhaps acquired land there. That is what many people think. But nonetheless, he had land and he sold it. Perhaps because he was a Levite, when he got born again, you know, all these scriptures were going through his mind. You know, these men have been talking about this and this and this. I'm part of the lineage of these the people who are supposed to be, you know, very dedicated in serving the Lord, in explaining scriptures to people. And the Holy Spirit began a very wonderful work in this man's life. But all we see is... He served the Lord with that. Sold it, the whole of it. He didn't keep part of it. Do you know that he had the right to keep some money for himself? But he didn't. He wanted to serve the Lord with it. And now, next year, we see the art of hypocrisy. You know Ananias, as I mentioned earlier, Ananias' name means God is gracious, but he took God's graciousness for granted. He was not mindful of the presence of God, for the fear of the Lord is acknowledging his presence at all times. While his wife's name meant beautiful, yet was very ugly from the inside. 
Sometimes we, we look at people and they look very nice from the outside. We know how to keep the outside well, right? We know how to pimp it. <laughs> we can pimp it. We make it nice. We spend hours and hours at the mirror. Apparently, we just get out of the mirror and we forget about ourselves. And we come again to confirm who we are. <laughs> we forget too quick. Her name means beautiful, yet was very ugly in the inside. It is therefore worth noting that the Lord judges sin severely at the beginning of a new period in salvation history. Just after, after the tabernacle was erected, God killed Nadab and Abihu for trying to present a false Fire to the Lord. That is in Leviticus chapter 10. He also had Achan killed for disobeying orders after Israel had entered the promised land. That is Joshua chapter 7. And these serves as a warning for us today. No sin goes unpunished. God hates sin. He hates it. Why do you think God would just let things be? Like they have sin, well, whatever. Let's just keep them. There's a writer called Oliver Holmes. He wrote and said that sin has many tools, but a lie is the handle which feeds them all. Sin has many tools. You know, like your, your tool room, you know, this wall has a lot of tools. All these tools, they have handles. <laughs> but a lie is the handle which fits all of them. Lie in this aspect, lie in this, lie in this, in this, in this, in this. Everywhere is lying. And you know what? When you lie once and you didn't get caught and you lie the second time, you give yourself the permission to lie the third time and the fourth time and the next time. Sin has many tools. We see also that the sin of hypocrisy is motivated or accelerated by pride. Pride comes before a fall, and a great falling for that matter. And pride will open doors for all sorts of sin. There are things that the Lord has mentioned to us. There are things that you know you, you're supposed to work on. But your pride won't let you. Won't let you. Like, I want to keep this. I want to continue doing this. I want to do this. I want... It, it doesn't matter. So long as they don't know, I'll keep on doing it. Don't let your pride get on the way. The church is God's temple in which he dwells. 1 Corinthians 3.16 and Satan wants to use people to go and dwell in there too. He wants to come and dwell in the temple of God using people. He wants to come and have a place. We also see that the church is God's army, 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. And Satan seeks to get into the ranks Many people as he can. He wants to get traitors in this army. The people who will not be honest. People who won't say the truth. He wants them in there. Church, if God was to drop dead people in the church today, how many of us would be still alive? How many? You know yourselves, right? <laughs> You're like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I'd be gone 
long time ago. I know it's very easy for us right now because we know the end of the story to condemn Ananias and Sapphira for dishonesty. But we need to examine our lives to see if our profession is backed up by our practice. Do we mean everything we pray for in public? Do we sing the hymns and the gospel songs sincerely or routinely? Do they mean something to you? Or they're just words that we know and we like this song. And it, a Sunday that we sing your favorite songs, like the service was wonderful today. Your favorite hymn, your favorite song. But when we come and we don't sing, like the church was kind of ish, ish today. <laughs> it was, you know. I think the present worship didn't practice well today. Or oh, there's an Akan. <laughs> there's an Akan in the worship team who need to be killed. We're waiting for the, the, the Lord to strike them dead. Is it just a routine? Or is we, we, we singing these words to the Lord sincerely? Lord, I need you every hour. Do we spend that hour needing the Lord? Or we think we can do an hour without Him and then try to find Him the next? Quite unfortunate. If God was to drop people dead, oh man. But in His sovereignty, He's not doing that today. And in fact, he just did it once so that we learn from it, so that we're not going back there to do the things that this couple did. And you see, he was asked, Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? He said, while it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own control? <laughs> in other words, this thing belonged to you. You were not coerced to sell it. And even if you wanted to bring just a quarter of it and keep the rest, that was perfectly right. But why do you want to deceive the Holy Spirit of God? Because you heard that these other men or these other people, they sold their properties completely and brought them before the apostle. And you want a name for yourself. In fact, their sin was not robbing God of money, but robbing God of his glory. That is what they wanted. They wanted to be, you know, people to pat them on the back and say, well done, bro. Thank you for bringing all this money to the church. That is why as Calvary Chapel, we make it a point, especially the pastors, not to peep into the money record, to see who gave what, who gave what, who gave what, so that you start to cluster people. We don't do that. Ananiah was struck dead. Because he lied to the Holy Spirit. There and then he said a lie and he was struck dead. Ananias was dead. But then after three hours, his wife shows up and he has no idea where his hubby is. <laughs> it's only three hours. Remember, this gathering has a lot of people, thousands of people. I don't know how it didn't get to her so quickly. Maybe because of the death of this man, people are a little bit afraid to talk about it. 
like, um, I wanted to say something, but I'm afraid <laughs> this will hurt you. But I got to tell you that your husband is dead. <laughs> like, how? We just sold the land. We want to go to Miami. <laughs> we want to go to Hawaii to go enjoy our money. What do you mean? I don't mean this Hawaii up here. <laughs> You know, there's a Hawaii up here, you know, you can even walk there. The real Hawaii is beautiful. I would want to go there one time before I die. She didn't know. After three hours, she shows up before the apostles and she's asked again <laughs> to say the truth. But because they had planned. You know, it, it is good to have one language. You know, as, as a couple, it says something. It's, it's important. But this is a lie. This is not honesty. Let us just lie together. So that people will not know what is happening. His wife didn't even know. You know what this tells us? That the enemy takes pleasure when God's people are kept in darkness. Because perhaps hearing these words from people, you know, the, the fear would have fallen upon her and said, well, he died because of this. Let me go repent of my sins. Let me go make it up. Let me go come clean out of this. But the enemy desires that God's people will just sink and sink into the depths of their sins. At the point where Sapphira showed up, there was God's grace available for her to make things right, but she deliberately chose to go the enemy's way. Perhaps if she repented, her life would have been spared. You say, yes, this is how much we sold the land and we kept this. That was not right. It was a lie. It was not proper. Lord, please forgive me. Do you think the, the Lord would have struck her dead? The Lord would have been gracious to this lady. But she chose to go the opposite way. And honestly, that is many of us. After we fall out of God's grace, there are always great opportunities for us to make things right. But our pride often won't let us go clean, do things right. Church, this is... This is a warning for us. It's a great warning for us. Uh, uh, even as you're serving God with your resources, what's the condition of your heart? Do you do it because some of your friends did it? Why do you do it? When we began reading here, we saw that there was great power as they testified of the resurrection of Christ. There was great power, and they were filled with great grace upon all of them. And lastly, we see that there is great fear that has come into the church, and everyone who heard about this story, they feared what God would do to people who are not honest. And that is why we see the church was growing, growing, growing. God hates sin, friends. Don't encourage yourself and say, because we are not struck dead today, maybe it's, you know, it's, it's nothing to him. No, it's, it is everything. He hates a prideful heart. He hates a lying tongue. He does, he says in his word. 
So be careful as I bring the worship team to come. Think about these words. They lied to God, lied to the Spirit of God, and lied to the Spirit of the Lord. And you know, he said, why have you agreed together to taste the Holy Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. Like, is he dead, really? <laughs> I left him a few hours ago. Is he dead for sure? It's only three hours. Say, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door. And they will carry you out. Maybe you would think what is going through her mind is they will carry her out to go and mourn the husband. <laughs> to do something reasonable, right? They will carry you out. These are very dangerous words for you to hear before your last breath. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom. These people will say, you know, I preach in your name. People were brought back to life through your name. We, we, we prophesied through your name. And Jesus would say, get off me. I never knew you. I never knew you. And now she thinks she has served the Lord with her money and what she's being told, they're going to take you. They're going to take you. Where? Home? Nope. <laughs> they're going to bury you beside your husband. Let us be diligent, friends, in our walk with the Lord, that these things the enemy will not find a foothold in us to destroy our lives. We know the schemes of the enemy. He will try with this aspect. If it fails, he goes to the next. If that fails, he goes to the next. I pray that you be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit to know how you ought to conduct yourself when God's blessings are resting upon you. It is a big deal with finances, with money, with things that we are so attached to. Ask God to help you. No one is prone to these attacks from the enemy. He can attack any one of us. Lord, we come before you. We pray that you be gracious to us. We know that it is by your grace that we are still here. And your mercies that are new every morning. And your loving kindness that we are spared. Not because of what we have done, but because of what you have done for us. So Lord, I pray if be there people amongst us who need to repent for some sort of sin, Lord, I pray that you prompt them to do so. Because we know where it leads to. Sin leads to death. We all want to see you. We all want to be with you at the end of time. So please, we ask that you be with us, O oh God. Holy Spirit, guide us. And especially the, with the issues to do with finances and money and possessions. Help our hearts so that we'll not be so attached to them that we can't serve you with them. Help us, O oh God. And even this morning as we serve you with them, as we give to you, help us to give to you a percentage that is glorifying to you, O oh God. We thank you. 
We pray that you forgive us individually, forgive us as a church, so that we'll walk righteously and holy before you. We thank you, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.